So you're wondering, will Ghidra run on Linux? Or specifically, will it run on Kali Linux? And why would you do that? A lot of the stuff that I pull apart, a lot of the malware is designed for Windows. It's an executable and you can't double click and accidentally run an executable or an SCR file or any of the DLL files in a Linux system. So it might be advantageous to install Ghidra on a Linux system. Now, why will it work? Well, it's based on Java. So any platform, Mac, OS, Windows, Linux, whatever that runs Java can of course run Ghidra. Now, download the Ghidra first. Some have been telling me this is actually G-Hydra, but uh, I'm still going off the wiki pronunciation. So let's download Ghidra and uh, unzip it to a spot wherever you know where it is on your Linux system. Uh, it won't be tarred or anything, it'll be just zipped. So pull that down first. Once you've got that down, there are some official instructions. So here you go for Linux and Mac OS, extract it out. Yep, you're gonna do that. Um, you're then going to create a path um, sorry, you're going to first of all install Java if you don't have it, and then you're going to create it in the path variable so that it can find Java, and then believe it or not, wherever you dump Ghidra, it's going to run. So what do we do? Well, the first thing I did in my Kali Linux is do a sudo apt-get install default-jdk, and that brought Java down for me. Luckily for me as well, that also edited my path statement. Then what I did is I unzipped the Ghidra zip file and it became this bit of a monster. Um, again, wherever you decide to dump it, that's where it's going to run from. And then you just run this command and away you go. So let's have a look and watch Ghidra come up, shall we? That looks identical to what I saw in the Windows environment. In fact, it's going to behave exactly the same as the Windows environment because it's running in the Java virtual machine. So yes, I can actually run this in Kali and generally Linux or Mac or wherever I want. So let's uh, work through this the same as we, way as we have previously. Uh, we're going to create a brand new project and we're not going to share it. It's just me playing with this and I don't care that home directory looks fine. I'm just going to call this temp because I'm going to delete this when I'm finished. And I'm now going to bring an executable into this particular project. So I'm just going to go to the hard drive and find that executable. So here we have a screensaver, a Windows based screensaver that I'm going to drag in and I've done that. So it's now importing that into the project. Now I happen to know this is a Windows x86 so that looks like it's picked it correctly and everything looks fine so we're going to import that. Okay, and that's imported it. Now, here's where we run into some little issues. First thing, we're trying to import external libraries, user32 DLL and kernel32 DLL and ntdll.dll. Obviously, we're not gonna be able to do that as we're not running on a Windows system. So let's click OK and see what we get. If we right click and we open with the code browser. Whilst that's running, is this thing I'm looking at a virus? You had better believe it. Look at this monster. And it's got all kinds of backdoors and things going on. In fact, we've got a very high detection rate of 52 out of, I believe, 57. So that is a very, very, very high detection rate. And it's even though it's a screensaver, it's obviously a PEXE. So there's some details about the file here. Uh, this basically gives us the hash so we can sort of scan for it elsewhere in Google and things like that. Tell us a little bit about what it imports, what it uses, the behavior. Um, it creates a process. Look at that awful GUID there that creates what mutex it uses and what it looks for and what people have said in the community. So we have a few people here talking about it being malware, which we know it's malware anyway. Um, we got uh, some files that apparently it drops and we got some links to other people who've gone and scanned it and done things. Maybe we should uh, put this through hybrid analysis and see what it gets up to. 
So here we are in hybrid analysis. Let's now drag and drop that file back in here, shall we? So the hybrid analysis is now beginning. Uh, just go to consent and I'm not a robot and continue to let the process start. Choose what sort of a sandbox we're interested in and just give it a go. While that's going away and I'm in the queue, there we are in the queue. Let's go back to Ghidra. So back in Ghidra, I'm going to do the full analysis. Here we go. So the only thing it's not going to be able to do is it's not going to be able to import those DLL files. Now we can see it's an MZ header. There's the eMagic byte there. So we know it's an executable. All right, so there we go. Um, okay, she's telling me that... Uh, yeah, okay, so she's telling me that it's a... Uh, file that's an executable but it's not called an executable which we know anyway all right so from in here i can see that's using kernel 32 i can see all the things it's trying to access um just flicking ahead trying to find out any information about this we've got data and we've got the resources so we can see in here if it's got an icon associated with it or anything else that's going through it Okay, oh, there we go. They use a, a PDF icon. And there's also some other little icons hidden in it. Some of them look like uh, it's the bitmap cache maybe for the tool buttons in it. I've not seen that before. That's quite interesting, actually. I thought they're just icons stored in there. So here we go, we've got the imports. And of course, it doesn't quite know what to do with those imports. Um, it can't find kernel 32 and we've got the exports and we've got the entry here and all the other functions beneath it we've got the functions mem set okay again it's talking to ntdll so there are some drawbacks to doing it in linux there's a few things that don't quite work the way they should because it can't quite find the files it needs. I have yet to try dumping the DLLs into the same directory as the virus, um, or maybe into Ghidra, uh, or if there's some way to actually tell Ghidra to find those files and copy them off a Windows machine. Um, however, this is what it's all about, a bit of experimentation to find out how it all works. So before I start uh, digging too deep into the code, I'm now just going to work out how easy it's going to be to pull apart the code. I can already see here, someone's been using some very interesting uh, text. Here we go, a little bit of text. Um, I would suggest this has been obfuscated, so it's going to be very hard to read. So let's have a look at the search. And search for strings. Five is fine, search. And already I'm not disappointed. Look at this. Almost everything is in some way ausfocated. Um, as we scroll down, we've got even more here. So it looks like they've probably created procedures. Each one's got an ausfocated name. It's highly likely if I was to disassemble this and try and read it, I would need to spend considerable time on it trying to figure out what it does. So rather than pull it down to its bare essence let's see if we can get some clues from hybrid analysis okay so hybrid analysis is now finished and as we can see the icon for that str file has now popped up just as per the resources in ghidra so if we go and look at the uh, group icon under ghidra uh, Actually, if we look at the bitmaps, so that's the menu bitmaps. And there's the icon right there. So it is the icon being used for it. Let's go and have a look and see what it does, shall we? Right, so it reads terminal services related RDP keys. Okay, so it's trying to check to see what's going on with the RDP. Contact three domains. Interesting. Those three domains. Ah, oh, okay, so it's checking the dynamic DNS um, and a few others there as well. And it's using a HTTP GET command to download something. Oh no, here we go. 
that's just to check the uh, current IP address. Let's go back up to the top here. As we scroll down, it's got 15 different types of attacks. Let's have a look at what it's doing. So it's got those hooks happening there, um, and all sorts of process injections and modifying registry and remote desktop access. So it's doing quite a few things. That's very interesting. Let's scroll down a bit further. So we've also got various other alerts popping up here. Identified as a virus. Yes, we saw that already in virus total. And it's found some IPs and some URLs, which might help us find out a bit more about what's going on. Allocates virtual memory in a remote process. Okay. So it must at some point rename itself to a .exe and run itself. And then you've got this attack ID. Now these attack IDs, by the way, if you Google them and then you select the MITRE attack website, it'll actually give you some details, a bit more about what this actually means, which is very, very handy. Uh, we've got some network related information here. Yeah, our signature match. Okay. And as we go down, we can see it's got some, uh, here we go, some kernel debugger information. So it looks to see that something's actually monitoring it or not. Queries internet cache settings. Um, reads the active computer name. So there's quite a lot going on here. Now, rather than worrying about pulling apart this particular SCR file, today was more about to see if we can do the same things that we would normally do in a Windows operating system. So at the moment, um, I've been able to run Ghidra. I've not been able to get all the imports from all the various DLL files. I've had a few errors pop up, but things are working. Uh, because hybrid analysis and because uh, virus total uh, web based cloud tools, then obviously in a Linux environment, I can use those and I can do my testing. So I've been able to sandbox and run this in a Windows 7 machine. I'm able to um, do things like see the virtualization, sorry, visualization of the executable file, how much of its text, how much of its data. I can see that it's actually a DLL file. Um, I can do everything I would normally do right down to getting screenshots, um, downloading the executables if it pops any of them out, um, extracting strings. I can do quite a bit, and I'm doing all this within a Linux environment. So, is Linux a problem running Ghidra? I'd suggest not. You have to be a bit smarter about thinking about how the DLLs work, and the imports work, and the exports work. But really, it's not a, not a, cha a game changer at all. Um, I've got no problems with running this at all. In fact, I've now swapped across from my Windows machine to Kali Linux as my main desktop. Now for about five or six weeks. And I've found absolutely no uh, tools that I need that are missing. And I'm just not inhibited in any way. So if you want to go and do the same thing I've been doing, pulling apart executables on Windows, but you want to do it with your Linux machine, go for it. It's going to work perfectly fine. As long as you understand how DLLs work and how it imports and exports from Windows DLLs, then uh, you can fill in the blanks and away you go. So today has just been a bit of an experiment just to see how we go under Linux. I think we went quite well. How do you think we went? Give us some feedback. Drop it in the comments below. And if you like seeing what you see here and how we pull things apart, then, uh, yeah, subscribe. Ring the bell. Thank you very much.